Thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, today, we're, Lissa and I are going to be doing an introduction to glass bead making, um, which will start with a brief history of beads, then moving on to safety and equipment, and then with Lissa demoing and me narrating how to make your first bead. So let's start way back to the beginning when beads were first discovered. Dated about 38,000 BCE, which is about the time that Homo sapiens were replacing the Neanderthals. Beads at this point were made from animal teeth and bones and were worn as pendants. Beads continued to be found in a variety of areas, including Western and Central Europe, the Mediterranean, Russia, as well as China, Korea, Africa, and Australia. The designs of the beads and how they were combined to con continue to develop as early as uh, 17,000 to 10,000 BCE. They were also made out of ivory or shells and um, early humans also used volcanic glass or obsidian to make tools, weapons, and jewelry. These early beads were worn to display hunting prowess for spiritual expression and protection and were also uh, beginning to be found as grave offerings. Man-made glass beads and man-made glass began in Mesopotamia around 3000 BCE and then spread to Europe. The Egyptian glass beads were as treasured as precious stones and were primarily used symbolically. As we start to see the Egyptian civilization collapse and the military conquests of the Mediterranean area growing, we begin to see glass objects to be being produced for trade and commerce instead of just for the use of the elite. The Phoenicians were known for the glass make, their glass making skills that they learned from others, as well as those that they developed themselves. And you can see in Lissa's screen, she is showing us um, a, a Phoenician head bead, another Phoenician head bead. And what else does she have? Ah, so now we have the evil eye beads. And after the founding of Islam and the development of the uh, Muslim cultures, Islamic glassworking flourished from 700 BC to 1400, excuse me, 700 CE to 1400 CE. They utilized techniques that were found in Egypt and the Roman Empire, but they also integrated new styles and techniques into their bead making. And here we have Lissa Demon showing um, another example. The international trade of Islamic merchants enabled connections between Islamic artisans and those in other areas, such as Scandinavia, India, and China. We now move to the Romans. As the Roman Empire began, glass making spread to areas such as Spain, France, and Rhineland. The Romans traveled and trade followed. As different cultures became more advanced and connected, the spread of skills between these cultures grew and the level of craft skills developed. We begin to see complex artistry in our bead making, detailed, De decoration and shaping of glass beads. And you can see Lissa showing us here. Um, I can't quite see. Oh, is that a little vessel bead that Lissa is showing us? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so as the Roman Empire began to fall, glass working became more regional. And during the migration period in Europe from about the fourth to the eighth centuries, Cultures such as the Franks, the Merovingians, and the Anglo-Saxon were developing their own style of beads. And Lissa, um, it, um, can, you can you move that a little closer to the camera? So there we have an example of... These are uh, Frankish glass beads. And this is a strand of Anglo-Saxon glass beads. And this is another strand of Anglo-Saxon glass beads, but you can tell from the colors that they were influenced by the Frankish beads. Oh, excuse me. Towards the end, 
towards the end of the migration period around 800 to 1000 CE, glass bead making in Viking towns such as Reb and Burka really began to flourish. The Vikings brought beads back from their travels to areas such as Northern and Eastern Europe. And as the Vikings often settled in areas where they traded, beads were found in those locations too. One of those was a game piece. Very nice. The development of the Christian era meant that people were no longer burying with their goods. Jewelry was often inhibited by the church as it was considered to be a pagan practice. And bead making diminished until the 15th century when it reappeared and flourished in Venice. From the Renaissance to the 20th century, the European glass bead industry grew, as did the techniques for manufacturing. We also saw an increase in the volume of bead production and the variety of the beads that were being produced. Beads were also part of more complex trade routes along with other goods going from Europe to Africa. Lisa, were you showing us um, some examples of the trade beads? Um, I don't have examples of the trade beads, okay. but what I did want to do is get the um, history of beads book um, up ah, on the yeah. Uh, the Venetians set up bead making centers in Holland, Bohemia, and Moravia, now Czechoslovakia, and they prospered. They had the variety, type, and volume of the beads they produce grew. And though there were bead making centers in other areas, the bead making, excuse me, the glass making rather, in Venice was unmatched. So let's talk about glass. Ancient glass has the same component or has the same components as the types of glass that are being used by bead makers today. We have silica, which comes from something like sand. We have soda which is made from the ash of either burned aquatic plants or woodland plants. Now it's produced chemically and therefore much more easily accessible and lime. The addition of extra ingredients to these, either accidentally or purposeful, can change the quality of glass. The addition of metals gives us different colors. Cobalt is gonna give us blue, iron green, manganese purple, um, later in the Bronze Age, they found that manganese added in particular um, quantities could create colorless glass. Now we need heat. We need heat to form glass from its raw, these raw ingredients, but then we're also using it to reheat, shape, and manipulate pre-shaped rods of glass. In the ancient world, they used pre-shaped forms of glass, such as rods, ingots, grains, or lumps of glass. Glass was either sold or traded to glass, workshop, glass workers workshops all over. Period heat sources were made out of stone or clay structures fired with wool or charcoal. The Venetians used oil lamps, which is where we get the term lamp working. Modern heat sources come from to uh, torches with fuels. There are different methods of working the glass in period. One was called a hot trailing method where they had a ceramic dish or a crucible that had glass in it that was melted in the flame. And then a metal rod was placed into the molten glass to pick it up and wind it onto the mandrel, which was the, um, the metal rod. Then there was the ribbon winding or winding method. And that's where you had a rod of glass that you heated and then wound onto that metal rod, the mandrel. That's the same method that we'll use today and we'll get to see Lisa do shortly. Um, however, now we have much more widely available, diverse and sophisticated glass options than, than back then. And just to interject, I'm going to put the handout that um, Evelyn was reading from. And again, there are a couple pictures that can supplement what I showed on screen, including one of uh, our recreation of a period of bead furnace. Oh, yes. 
So before um, Lisa demos how to make a bead, um, we're going to talk briefly about safety equipment, safety and equipment. And starting with that, we need fire. So we are using a hothead torch with MAC gas. And you will see in one of the handouts we have is a kit, is a, um, a handout on how to put together a, a kit. And this is, um, this is a method where Lissa has the, the uh, MAP gas attached to her table um, with the torch is screwed onto the MAP gas. Because we're working with fire and we're working with glass rods that can crack, we need to follow safety precautions. Wearing natural fibers, closed-toed footwear, long sleeves or Kevlar sleeves, um, and long hair being tied back will all prevent you from getting injured if not only the flame, but if that glass cracks and flies. Wearing safety glasses is needed. Um, you know, the, the first thing people may start with are clear, inexpensive clear glasses, which Lissa has in front of her. However, if you're using the torch consistently, you not, not only need to protect your eyes from, from the glass, but also from the flame itself. When soft glass begins to conduct heat, it's no longer in risk of thermal shock, but we now have what's called soda flare. And that's a bright flare or flash of the flame that occurs from the soda being burned off the glass rod. With these glasses on, you can't see the flame, um, but it's protecting your eyes. So when you're first beginning, um, Lisa will, first of all, will show us when she has the flame on in a little bit, you'll get to see the difference. Um, so sometimes when we start, you, it's easier when you can see that flash to know where you are in the flame. But um, like I said, as you're doing it more often, having those glasses is, is an important safety precaution because that, that flare will damage your eyes over time. If a piece of glass cracks off, you're going to stay calm. If it lands on you, you brush it off. And we also suggest you never stand up with the flame on. Always turn it off before moving away. Um, so now we are going to talk about the flame. The flame, and I don't know, Lisa, if you want to turn it on now or you want me to go um, talk about a little bit about the flame yeah, first. Yeah, I can turn it on. Just give me a minute to get the camera into position. You got it. And I will just um, say, we'll, we'll talk about the flame itself. But in addition to the torch and the flame being hot, what we're going to, what um, you won't see it, but you'll feel it, is that the areas around the flame are hot. The sides, the front, the back, and even well above the flame where you're not seeing anything is still going to be hot. Um, you'll see that, you know, we will not reach um, above or across the torch. Liz is going to be paying attention to where the glass rods land and the tools are. We always make sure that the hot side of the glass rod is away from you. And it often is helpful to um, have a, be consistent in where you place things. So you always know that things are going to be in, in, a, certain, in a certain place. Um, if, if you do need to move your mandrel to the other hand, you will often switch it um, under the flame. And that way, if anything drops, it's dropping on your table and not on you. So Lissa has used a, um, has started the, the torch and I didn't see if you used a, um, a oh, yep, the, you have two options, the, the sparker and the other uh, flame thing. I know if you're using something like those big lighters, when you're done with it, put it away from your table. Um, Lissa will have, um, and if you can see on her, on her station, on her table is going to be a piece of metal. Um, sometimes we often just start with a cookie sheet, but a piece of metal for, for the, the hot glass to rest on. And um, there you go. So the flame has three areas. The lowest is where is the blue flame right above the torch. And you'll see it's a kind of a blue cane, a blue cone at the tip. We're not going to use this area. And if your glass does go down into that blue area, you'll hear a hissing sound and you know you're too low. The next area up 
is called the working area. This is where we're gonna melt glass, we're gonna work with it, we're gonna shape it, we're gonna wind it, or I should say we're gonna melt, wind, and then work the glass. The last area up that we work in is where we preheat the glass rods and where we begin to cool down the bead. In it, um, when I talked about where everything is, um, the hot parts. So Lissa is gonna start with a glass rod. We're using soda lime glass rods, which are also known as a soft glass. They come in opaque or transparent. This soft glass is gonna melt at lower temperatures and it stays soft for a longer time. Um, the opaque rods are, are even softer and will melt more easily than the transparent rods. The colors of some rods are easier to see when melted. Um, for instance, yellow will turn red, red will turn black. Others, you don't see such a significant change. So Lissa just dipped her mandrel, that uh, metal rod, into what we call bead release. It's made from clay. And we need this on our mandrels so we can get our finished beads off of the mandrel. Glass will stick to uncoated mandrels. While you're making a bead, if you feel as though um, the glass isn't sticking to the mandrel and the bead release, the bead release has come off, it's, it's cracked, you stop, put your bead down, put your mandrel down, and you'll need to start over. So Lissa is dipping the glass rod into the bead release. And you can either let these air dry, which takes some time, or we can flame dry. And that is where you literally dry it in the flame. Because the, the bead release needs to be dried um, before we can use it. Liz is gonna be holding the glass rod in her dominant hand. It's typically done in an underhanded pencil-like grip. And you see, can see where she holds her hand. It's not too far to the end um, uh, towards her because then you have less control and certainly not close to the end near the torch. She is going to be, so glass, let me start with this. Glass needs to be tempered or heated up slowly or it will um, crack, which is called thermal shock. So Liz is going to be holding the rod vertically, and she's gonna introduce it into the flame, moving just the end of the rod in and out of the flame. She's gonna be pointing it away and down because whichever direction the tip of the rod is pointed is the direction any broken glass will fly. And you can see where she has the rod. It's up in that third section of the flame where it's not our working area, but it's the, the area to, to gradually heat up the rod. And you can see it start to change colors. And because it's a red rod, we're gonna see it start turning black. And she's gonna get it warmed up. And the goal is that it's gonna start to glow. When it starts to glow, we know that it's, it's warm enough that it's not likely to shock. So now you, Liz has turned her wrist so that the glass rod is horizontal. And this gives her the ability to slightly roll the glass rod up and down so that all sides of the rod are heated and melted. And the other benefit of being horizontal because as the, um, the end of the glass becomes molten into what's called a ball or a gather, the gather is gonna be affected by gravity. So if the gather starts to go um, dip a little bit down, she can turn the rod up and she's gonna melt that glass to get to the size gather that she wants. The smaller the gather, the easier to manipulate when you're first learning. The bigger the gather, the more glass you'll be winding on your mandrel. You'll notice in her other hand, she has picked up the mandrel kind of in an overhand position and is heating it up. The mandrel and the bead release, the bead release in particular needs to be heated so that the, the molten glass will stick to it. So this is where you're kind of starting to do two things, two different things with each of your, you know, a different thing with each of your hands. Once the gather is ready, your mandrel's warmed, You'll notice that Lissa has turned her wrist back so that the glass rod is now vertical. She is going to touch the tip of the gather 
to the heated mandrel. The end of the glass rod is in the flame and the mandrel is just below the flame. She's rotating the mandrel away from her as she slightly pulls the glass rod toward her. She's keeping the mandrel and the glass rod in the same position as she winds the glass around the mandrel and she's made a complete circle. And you may have noticed is that in order to remove the rod from the glass rod from the bead, she pulled the glass rod slightly towards her and down and essentially let the flame cut the glass and that's called flame cutting. She put her grass, glass rod down safely on the cookie sheet and she's continuing to rotate the mandrel away from her. Glass wants to be spherical. However, gravity can take effect. So rotating your bead is going to allow it to form evenly. If one side is bigger than the other or starts to droop, holding that side to the top of the mandrel in the flame briefly will help the glass even out. The other thing you want to be conscious of is that you're holding the mantle straightly horizontally to ensure a more even bead. If it's tipped, you're going to have glass droop. And at this point, you continue working to the bead to, to do what you want with it, either shaping it or decorating it. And once it's done, once you're done, you want to move the bead away from that working part of the flame. It could be behind it, it could be above it, as you continually to rotate that mandrel so the bead can keep its shape as it's cooling. And we need it to cool enough to lose its glow, which is about 10 seconds. And we're slowly cooling the bead so it doesn't break. And then what we can do is it's called the tink test. If you clink the bead on metal, you will either hear a thudding sound, which means that it's not cooled enough yet, or the tink. And you'll, you'll get to hear the difference. The tink means that it is cool enough, and then you can put it um, into a substance called vermiculite to cool down slowly. And then listen, she's also turned off the flame um, prior to putting the, the, the mandrel in the can of vermiculite. Um, in the packet, one of the handouts, we do talk about um, some different options for cooling down those beads. Um, vermiculite is one. Um, Lissa has it in a straight coffee can. Um, you can also have it heated in a crock pot as a step one and then putting it in a metal coffee can. You live and learn. Um, another option is a, a fiber blanket and um, which can also cool the beads. Um, however, with a fiber blanket, every time you open up your little sandwich, you're letting cool air into there where your other beads are, um, are cooling down. I actually have one nearby I can show you. And that is how you make a bead. Um, so before we go on, um, I wanna see if there's any questions. I know one of the things that we can do is Lisa will take requests. Um, if you'd like to see her make another bead, um, we can also then show some, some different ways to either um, some beginning decorations of how to decorate the bead um, or some different, um, different yeah. types of beads. Exactly. Um, I, what I can also do uh, before um, we do some more demoing and while we wait to see if anybody has questions is show you a few more beads to just tell you a little bit about some of the basic designs that we can make and show you a few of the tools and components that are on my uh, cookie sheet that we can use to um, make beads. Uh, the first thing I can show you is, have to see how, how well I can do, is one of the first skills you're going to want to learn is how to shape beads. Um, when you're making your first bead, it's going to be this little donut shape that you can see. But after that, you can do things like add more glass, you can flatten it, elongate it, you can put indents into it, like the ribbed bead you see here. Um, the one I had up before was a cone-shaped bead. You can see it tilts slightly down on either side. And this is, you know, two beads uh, with an indentation in the middle. So lots of different shapes you can play with. After that, when you're starting to learn, um, you'll want to start working on 
that's probably what this bead is. This is a frit bead. It's basically a bead that has been rolled in multicolor um, glass, uh, tiny, tiny pieces of glass. Let's see if I can show you on the screen without um, damaging it, just like that. And you can buy frit, you can make your own frit. Um, it can be single color, multicolor, and then you just need to heat up the bead and dip it into the frit and the frit will adhere to the bead and then we can melt it in and that's a technique we can show you. After that, um, a, another technique would be to make dots. And all of the beads that I'm handling are period beads. A lot of these are Anglo-Saxon beads because that's sort of what I made my specialty. Um, the order I'm telling you in which to do them is also the order I figured out that would probably be the easiest to start with after I'd already started with something more difficult. Um, so perhaps you can make your life a little easier than I did mine. But you can see dots all around the side of the bead. Um, I also have another bead I'm going to show you is a, okay, let me find my camera, is a melon bead. Um, these date back to the Roman time. And they are a nice um, uh, earlier uh, bead that, that can be um, uh, fun to start with. Um, Lisa, do you also mind, um, we have a question about COE and different glasses and can they be mixed with other different Ooh, types of glasses? Absolutely. I'm going to finish talking about the different decorations, then we'll bump into that question. Sound good? Thank you. Awesome. So after fret and after you play with dots, you can play with pulling stringer. Stringer is a thin glass that we pull off the larger rod. Um, here's some commercial stringers but I'm also gonna show you how to pull your own. And then you can wrap those around the bead. You can do little waves around the bead. You can do zigzags around the bead. So again, simple techniques that we're starting to learn. Um, after that, you can, this is an example of a stringer wrapped around a long bead, but do you see the little um, holes in the design? That is called uh, raking and you can rake the bead to add decoration. If you see people make uh, cakes and things like that, they do that um, on cakes for decoration. Um, some other types of beads are, let's see, these twisted stringer beads. You can see that. And you make them by applying these twisted glass canes onto the bead, which again, we can also show you. And then finally, another type of bead you'll want to learn about and how to make are these uh, Marini beads. You can see the little design in there, kind of repeating design. That is actually created by taking one of, let's see if I can see if I can show you one of these little chips of glass that's from a longer cane. It looks kind of like the stringers. And if we have time, I can show you how that's made too. And you just cut it up and apply it to the glass. Um, so talking about- oh, I'm sorry, Lisa. Oh, sure. I was gonna say, here is a longer version of, whoops, oh, sorry. Here's a longer version of one of these I think you actually may, may have made this one a while ago. And then when you cut it, it would have the, um, the, that design. And I think I can probably find where I put some of my canes too. Just give them one second. Um, here we go, just getting them out now. But for COE, talking about combining the different COEs, um, you do not want to do that. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. But these are some of those canes. And then you can see there's a design and you just chop them into little pieces with a glass cutter and you can make those beads. 
Um, so COE is called the coefficient of expansion. It's how fast or slow the glass expands and cools. And if you mix glasses with different COEs, what's going to happen is they're going to expand and cool at different rates and they will end up cracking. Um, there's a simple test that you can do. I've never had to do it, but I've learned about it and read online. If you want to test to um, two glasses to see if they're compatible. Um, basically, and I'll be showing you how to do stringers a little bit later and twisted canes, but basically you make a uh, twisty, or not a twisty, basically you kind of melt these two um, glass rods together, pull them out into a small stringer, and let it wait. And if one of the uh, glasses curves a lot, that means it's not compatible because that means it uh, cooled at a different uh, coefficient. So that means you can't use them together. If you do, they'll um, be cracks in the bead. Um, the small exception to that, if you wanna get into detail, is some of the nice frit out there. There's Valcox frit that is at a slightly lower coefficient of expansion. It's like uh, 90 something. Um, you can use tiny, tiny bits of that, just like you, you can use tiny, tiny bits of dirt or ashes or metal in the bead, and it won't crack. You just can't use too many or too much. Any other questions? Because after that, what we can probably do is just have me make some different beads. Um, while I'm making beads, I won't be able to talk because it, the hothead is so loud. So Erica can, can narrate, or Evelyn can narrate and talk about um, what I'm doing. But if you have any questions as we go along, just throw them in the chat and we will be good there. So what should I make first thing? Oh, um, well, uh, uh, spots. So you can see Lissa is warming up her mandrel. And she is now, see how she's doing that vertical movement in and out of the flame. And you can see and watch as um, there's that flare, that soda flare, um, as that's getting heated up. And she's, as she's getting, so you can see that gather at the end, that molten ball of glass that's starting up. And she's getting ready for her touchdown. And you can see everything's staying in the same place with the exception of that mandrel being wound away from her. And she makes a circle with the glass. But now she's gonna add on more. We wanna make it bigger. So she does another round and she could and then she cut the flame off. Now she has to let that, that glass all melt together and it's gonna go into that, that spherical shape that it likes so much. And that's another way switching, she switched the, her hands right over the flame as, um, in front of the, and over the flame as well. And, and the reason for doing that is um, one, oftentimes we want our dominant hand to be, um, doing that motion and here she's shaping it. She has a graphic, excuse me, graphite paddle and she can use that um, to help shape the glass. She's rolling it and you can see how the glass is um, flattening out and now she's using the sides of it to make the edges more even. Um, uh, she has a marver here, a metal marver and can also be used for shaping, but it also works very well to hold frit. And she is rolling it in the frit. And back into the flame it goes so she can melt that frit. 
And she's also making sure that she's not changing the shape of her bead too much in the flame. And she, uh, Alyssa took the, the bead out of the flame to show us. Generally speaking, we don't want to keep it out of the flame um, too long. And there we go. And we can see she has uh, the frit melted into her glass on the bead. Okay, let's see what she's gonna do next. Alyssa, do you wanna do spots? Uh, probably I will do spots with a full rod and then I can pull a stringer and then do spots oh. and simple decorations with the stringer. Beautiful. Okay, she's got her torch lit. And I believe this is the same glass rod that she used just a moment ago. So you may find that it, it may not need as, as much time to heat up as, um, as it did the first time around. And you can see the end is already starting to molt. I mean, become molten. She's getting ready to do her touchdown where she puts the, the, the gather on the end of the mandrel. And you may not be able to see it from this angle, but the mandrel is actually not in the flame. It's, oh, there we go. Thank you, Lissa. It's, it's literally just the end of the glass rod that's in the flame. Otherwise, the glass would all just, would not form a bead and it would just become a molten mess. So now she is continuing to wind it and to make it into the shape she wants. And she moves it into her dominant hand. And she's got her, her graphite paddle or marver. And she's gonna shape the, shape the bead. Let's see. Okay, she's switching back into her other hand so that she can pick up that glass rod in her dominant hand and warm it up. You can see how much higher where it, you can't see the flame, but it is it, that it is hot there and there is um, And you notice she kind of moves the, 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 the glass bead in and out of the flame a little bit. We need to keep it warm. Um, we don't want it to cool down too much. The same token, we don't want it to, to be um, glowing and molten um, as we're adding in, um, adding on more glass. And she's made. So she heated up the end of her red rod and she brought the other, uh, the, the bead towards the flame and just enough to get it warm in the spot where she wants the new glass to land and, and touches down, gives, and then you notice she's pulling back a little bit and she's letting the flame actually cut the glass between the spot and the rod. And now she's gonna roll it. She's gonna roll it and let those spots make sure they stick on. She can use her marver to flatten them out. And what she needs to do is she needs to get the one spot that she wants to shape or manipulate, get it a little warmer in the flame and then go back onto the, the marver. We never put those tools in the flame. 
you'll notice that she's always working outside the flame when she when she used one of the shaping tools. And she's instead of making a a bead with um, with raised dots, um, like I call them, like nubbies, she's actually making flattening them. And they will then melt into the into the glass into the bead. And there you go. And it looks like you can see the bead she's holding in her right hand actually has the, 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 the spots are much more raised. Whereas on the one she just made, they've been flattened and then melted. So they're more smooth with the bead, with the glass bead. Um, so you can also kind of see a little bit in her setup. She's working in front of windows. Both of her windows are open. She's got fans blowing the air, um, the, uh, the fuel gases out of, out of her window. I also have another fan behind me. They're set on low oh. for, the, for the sound, but um, that also helps blow air. Yeah. And for, for people who are, who are making, um, who are doing glass working and, and making beads um, on a, uh, on a um, more professional or long-term um, basis may have um, um, more advanced ventilation and setup if they're gonna be exposed to um, the, the, gas, the fuel for long periods of time. And um, we, we it, it, in the handout, we also have safety recommendations. Of course, there's a fire extinguisher nearby. Um, um, Lissa also um, has a um, some type of container with water in it. Um, there we go. And that way, um, if um, she can either, if, a, if, a, if something's going wrong, she can put, put it in the water. And the yellow, with the yellow glass rod, you can really see how it heats up red. And that's often why when, we're, when we start teaching, we often do that, the red rods and the yellow rods, because it's so obvious um, when, they, when, they get, when they get hot. Let's see, what is, ah, so Lissa has a hollow metal chopstick and tweezers. These are two different ways that you can pull a stringer. She has the glass rod. She's making a gather at the end. We need that to take that gather and either attach it to the chopstick, which is what Liz is going to show us. She needs to get the end of the metal warm or hot so that the glass will stick. And you can see how she adjusts her, just her rod so that gather goes up when it needs to. So now she's out of the flame, she's attached the, uh, the chopstick or what we call punty to the end of the, the glass and she's slowly pulling it evenly and slowly. Pulling that glass out and she has to make sure that when she pulls, um, she pulls at the right speed um, um, the right length, so it's not too thin, it's not too, it's not too thick, it's even, and that little bit of glass at the end of that, um, that metal chopstick came right off with a little bit of water. And now she used her tweezers to pull off that, um, the, the flat part of the glass that was sticking to the chopstick. Um, just to add, the water shocks the glass, so it will uh, fracture it and allow it to uh, break easily, either with your tweezers or allow it to fall off the um, chopstick. Mm -hmm. It's using that, that shocking for our benefit. And 
And um, I think also what you've noticed, Liz has been using the glass rod. She's been using have been primarily opaque. <clears throat> which can be um, can be helpful when, when you're starting. It does go, um, it, it melts a little, um, can melt a little easier. You can really see it, the, it's molten state. And there she goes. She's gonna wanna make that be bigger. So she's gonna, Make sure the bead is not glowing anymore. And then add in another. Ah, she's actually doing it next to the bead. So she's actually making a bigger bead. By making, laying down that glass one next to the other and now another round on top. And now all that glass is going to melt and form a shape. And you notice that that marver is right out of the flame. Okay. Now she has that stringer at the end of her yellow rod. And that rod now makes a lovely handle for her stringer. She heats up the tip of the stringer. And you notice she put that glass right in the flame for a minute to warm it up and then attach the dot. And then use the flame to cut. And she's going to go around and make additional dots. If you want a dot, they're not even, you want them bigger, you can add a little more glass to that, to a particular dot. She's heating up the end of her stringer again. You see she puts the, the bead back in the flame. That's those dots, you want them to adhere. And I think if I just saw correctly, let's just, if you notice, she put a little bit of glass on the tip of the mandrel. That could be a great, um, sometimes we can do that to, if you're trying to space out those dots evenly and you need like a reference point, um, it's hard to see when you turn the bead, maybe where a dot is, but that's one thing you can do is put it on the end of the mandrel um, that lines up with the dot on the bead. Now she's adding lots of dots. And now we need, we need all of those dots to adhere and then uh, melt in as much as Lissa wants them to melt into the glass versus being raised. And we can see them. And Lissa, um, note, I will note, is keeping that bead out of the flame to show us um, is some, not something you would necessarily be doing when you're making um, making a bead because you don't want it to, um, to be out of the flame that long and not be in the vermiculite once it's, it's out of the flame. I'm going to see if I can get my camera just a little bit closer and then I can do some more demonstrations. Okay. Were you also, um, Lisa, going to use the, the tweezers to make a stringer? I totally can. And then I can draw with it if you want. Yes, please. Um, when you were putting the glass at the end of the mandrel, um, 
was it was it to get off some extra glass or were you trying to use it as a ah um for that i was trying to get off the xx excess glass um because if i'm making a dot and i start with uh a stringer that already has like a bulb of of glass on the end that's going to create yes. a bigger dot and i won't be able to keep things uh even and so that's one way to get rid of it this is in one of our uh what do you call it um handouts but this is the book that I love. It's a little bit expensive, but it will talk about a lot of the details, such as how to um, get dots in the right placement and take you all through the basics. She's very detailed there. And I will note, you can get it on Amazon. I actually got a used copy that is in amazing shape, um, which um, for me was able to cut the price down, but it, you'd never know it was other than the sticker that says who it used to belong to. It is, yeah, so made it I'll, much more affordable. So what I'll do is I'll pull a stringer using the tweezers. Um, then I will make a bead, put the stringer around the bead in a design. And I think I might even want to do um, the indents of a melon bead. Yeah, done that and what tool, what tool do you, did you just show us, Lissa? So you could use a, a butter knife or um, an X-Acto knife. I actually have a tool that was just made by uh, somebody's spouse who also makes beads. It's a little iron tool twisted oh, yes. and they have a bunch of different little heads on them. And I just really like this one. Yep. I actually, uh, when I first was doing it, um, I had a uh, Pampered Chef knife for kids <laughs> that has worked very well um, for that. But then I also did get an exacto, uh, exacto knife that, that yeah. works well as well. And then this is a razor blade just attached to a exacto handle. Like, yeah. So I can do it like that. Lisa, would you show us the hiss of the, um, oh, you turned, I don't know if your volume's still on. If your microphone's on, you can show us what happens when you get too close to the blue cone at the bottom. There's our hiss. Thank you. So instead of using that metal, hollow metal chopstick, another way of pulling stringers is to use a pair of tweezers. Tweezers are a really helpful tool. I mean, you can use them to um, pick up hot glass. You can use them, in this case, she's, after she's got her gather where she wants it to be, Liz is gonna use the tweezers uh, to hold the, the gather, the other side of the gather. And there's all different types of teaser, tweezers in different shapes. And you can see how she's changing the, the positioning of her hand and the rod um, to manipulate her gather where she wants it to go. And in fact, made a bigger gather by letting it fall back on the rod and then heating that up. She's gonna snip the gather and then she lets it cool down just a little bit and then starts to pull. And changing the speed of one side of the pull to the other, the angle is going to impact the, not only the length and the thickness, but the evenness of the, uh, throughout the stringer. And she's flame cutting the stringer off of the end of her rod. And again, the tweezer is able to hold the stringer for her. I was looking for a pair of thicker tweezers because they would have held the stringer a little bit better as I flame mm. cut it, but I just couldn't find anything within reach. There we go. Probably 
something mm. like this is what I would have wanted to use a little yeah. bit easier to, to grab. Here we go. And then you can see the end of that. I'm going to want to take that off uh, before I do anything with it. And you could do that a couple ways, either by shocking it or like I did before, by just putting it onto the end of a mandrel. You can see this is starting to heat up the end of that rod in the higher portion of the flame. We can't see it, but it's there. And there we go. She's touching down. And remember what we were talking about the history. This is essentially the same thing that was done in period in the Middle Ages. It was, you know, instead of this is um, a stainless steel mandrel, um, sometimes you can make them out of um, welding rods. It would have been a um, maybe a blacksmithed mandrel. Um, Still could have been a glass rod. And instead of the, the map gas and the hothead torch, it would have been some type of bead um, furnace um, and, and um, charcoal. Um, they too would have shaped the beads with some version of marvers. They would have had um, like the, the blacksmith um, punty tool that Lissa showed. Um, there would have been uh, a, a form of bead release. They would have pulled stringers. So Lissa's getting that, that useless curvy end of her stringer off and your bead release on your mandrel is a great place to do it. And you know when we first, oh okay, so now what Lisa, Lisa is doing is she is essentially drawing or painting, so to speak, with her stringer. So one thing to think about, and the Passing the Flame book is really good in talking about this. Um, it talks about where you want to put your stringer in the flame. I don't want to put it all the way in the center because that's going to melt it too fast. So you want to keep it near the side. You can see how it's just starting to glow but it's not getting uh, too molten or too hot. Um, the other thing to think about is once you find this kind of sweet spot where the stringer is able to be melted but not you know, too goopy, try to move the bead uh, rather than uh, moving the stringer. I don't always succeed at that, but that can help because it will keep your glass at the same uh, temperature and then you can just move the bead back and forth as you are uh, putting on your decoration. And, and I will add, <clears throat> as one is learning to do this, um, sometimes you remember to move it going in one direction, but then not the other. Yeah. So it's, it's a learning process. Like, like everything is a curve. And you can see some of that turned out well. Some of it, I actually got the bead too close to the flame and the bead uh, melted as the stringer was melting. So they got a little 
smudged together right around there. So keeping your bead behind the flame is also important. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's a great point is the flame. You know, we talked about that working area, um, but really um, we, we, you get to um, where you can use the flame um, and, and around the flame to help you do what you want to do. Right now, Liz is using the edge of that tool um, to, put indentations into the into the bead, making this like a Roman melon bead. And you see how she heats the bead, uh, particularly in the, towards the spot where she wants it to be hotter. Takes it right out of the flame and then puts the tool in the glass. There we go. Let's see. There, there we go. go. Ta-da. You see the little indents. Yeah. Um, but that was a great example of how Lissa um, heated up one section of the bead um, that she wanted to work with. Um, and, and we, it, the, the flame really in, in parts of using parts of the flame to achieve um, different um, techniques or things that you want can, can really be a great tool. So right now I'm just making some more mandrels because I'm running out. And I don't know if anyone, if you were able to open up the documents with the handouts for equipment, um, if you have any questions about that, um, please um, shout out on the chat if, if you do. Um, what we did was we tried to, you can buy, you can buy whole uh, kits together um, and then supplement uh, parts of it. And you can also buy everything separately. Um, um, we put several different, for instance, the glass, where to get the, the glass and the torches from um, and, and the other pieces of equipment. Um, So what I think I can show next is I can show um, if you can see this uh, raked bead that has a, the stringer swirled across it and then the design raked down. Uh, you can rake using uh, what's in my hand right here, which is like a little pick that came with my first kit. Um, you can use a dental pick. You can also rake with... Uh, a stringer itself that's a little bit more advanced um, because you have to make sure not to melt the stringer. So I'll show you how to do it with the uh, tool that's not gonna melt first. And also just so you can see on this uh, game piece, uh, these designs were made by raking too. So it's the exact same thing. Uh, this was made off mandrel and I can talk about that a little later. This is a piece that went around about like six months ago or so and then everybody sends it to you and you're like, okay, I have to make it now. Oh, what I can also try to do is show the um, the goggles. The effect. Oh, yeah. Whoops. Let me see if I can get it. <laughs> can you see that? Yeah. So you can see how that, that bright flare goes away. You can still see the flame, and you can still see your gather. Um, and maybe, uh, Lisa, the next time if you put a glass rod into the flame before it's heating or as it's, as it's warming up, you can try it and show us again. I can do that right now. 
Okay, thank you. There we go. Ah, thank you. I'll now put them on my face. Very safe of you, thank you. Yes, and I will note that, you know, we did talk about long sleeves. You'll notice that Lissa's sleeves are pushed up and that's one of those things that, you know, it, that's a personal choice of knowing, you know, what, what you know, we, we tell you what the safety precautions are, you, you do them accordingly. Um, and Lisa knows what her safety limits are, her needs are. The one thing I will say, if you're making beads and garb, either don't make them in your good garb or wear a leather apron or another layer over it. I burned a very small hole in one of the Viking uh, apron dresses that I had just made and just applique or and just made. And so what I had to do to hide the hole is I had to learn how to applique. And, and I will note that um, one of the tips of advice I've been also given is if you're wearing um, a shirt that is lower cut and if you were wearing an undergarment um, having one that is a natural fiber is going to be your friend in the event that the rare event that a piece of glass might break off and fly down there okay so you can see this is making um, more of what's called a barrel shape Now she's got her stringer and she's going to make those, um, this uh, stripes or sp spirals. Oh, I guess they're more stripes. I apologize. And what I also did is I turned down the heat on my torch. Um, I wasn't fussing with that when I was just doing some of the simple dots, um, but you don't need the torch heat as high when you're working with this really thin piece of glass. And often just turning down the torch will make things work much easier for you. Much, much more control. Now, Lisa, do you sometimes also use the method of holding your stringer um, more vertically, hanging down from the bead, um, like this, and letting it? Ah, uh, like like that one. That one, yes. Usually, I do it the other way, um, but that's just because that's the way that I kind of first learned it. Mm -hmm. I can definitely show the other one. In addition to the book that Lissa um, and I talked about, also on that handout, um, putting together a bead making starter kit and places to learn how to make beads. Um, there are several um, links on the last page. So Lissa's got her rake and she is literally just, she put the bead in the flame, she took it out of the flame and then used her tool in this situation, you don't want the bead too hot, and you also 
um, don't want to push into the bead or pull too hard. And you can see I'm sort of waiting until it pulls off just a little bit before starting. Yes. So just to see if I can show you that so far. I'm now going to rake it the other way. You said you are going to rake it the other way? Yep. That's fun. you can see where I just raked it one one way I get these garland like lines but where I do both I get a nice zigzag and now you're gonna um, shape the bead up a bit exactly and the end the end which is also something you can do is have one end of the bead in the flame if you're focusing on that side versus the other You can see Liz has now got the other end of the bead um, primarily in the flame. I'm just shaping up the other end. Let's see if I remember how to do this. So with Liz, is, this is another way of applying the stringer and doing these spirals. Um, the angle at which you hold the stringer to the bead and where you're, the, uh, how angled or vertical the stringer is, is gonna impact um, the spiral, um, the angle of the spiral, even how far, you can affect how far the the lines are apart from one another. And Liz's stringer is getting very little now, so be careful. <laughs> she is raking with her stringer. So she brings it out, she lets it just uh, lose some of that glow, and then takes the stringer and uses it like that rake, that tool to to um, to pull gently, pull the glass to the end. So it's a little bit of a Franken bead, but you got the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so question, Lisa, once the beads put in the vermiculite, approximately how long should you allow it to cool? Super question. Um, Part of that depends on the size of the beads. The sizes of the ones I'm making, probably within 20 minutes, they would be fine. However, as I keep putting more and more beads in there, there's gonna be more and more heat. So that's going to make the time it takes them to uh, cool down take longer. Um, so just be aware of that. I have a backup can of vermiculite actually that I can switch to because I've got a lot going on in there. And then do you also find that the room temperature does makes has a somewhat of an impact? It might. I'm not one of those people who is observant enough to really notice details like that, but so, I know other people say. I, I will so the room that I am in um 
is um, does not have um, um, heat or air conditioning. It's right off the living room, so typically it's not a big deal. Um, sometimes in the very cold dead of winter, if the door's been shut um, and I have beads cooling in here, I need to be cognizant of that. But for most people, that's probably not a huge issue. <laughs> Um, so I could try to make a twisty now and then show mm -hmm. that application. That would be great. And yeah, because you've done, let's see, you've done a melon bead, you've done uh, uh, stripes, breaks. Um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, and so as, we have. as I said before, if at any time you want me to make something specific and, and feel free to just go a little bit crazy with the recommendations. I'll see what I can do. And if I can make it towards the end, we will. So, and you'll notice that the, the beads that, that we are focusing on are all um, um, reproductions of historical um, finds um, of beads and as, um, and across different, um, different countries. Um, the, uh, I will have to th say that the one country we have not mentioned is Ireland. That's been my area of um, special interest and um, where my projects have been, have been lying. And, um, and actually one of my favorite beads that um, is known to be native to Ireland um, or made in Ireland is um involves make it starts with um a, a, a twisted stringer in white and blue in white and blue yes um So Liz is now doing two things at once. Um, she's heating up the ends of both the yellow and the um, red rods um, at about the same time and at about the same amount of, um, of rod getting heated. And then she's sticking them together and she can use her, um, <laughs> her torch as a bit of a little marver to, to make sure that they get pushed together. We need them to um, connect and to glue together, so to speak, but we also need them to remain even and um, re remain um, to keep it shape so that they don't get twisted until we want them to. And you can see she's kind of turning them together, the two rods together in the flame, making sure that it remain um, both sides or you know of of the rods are getting heated and getting heated together. Now she's got a bit of a a, a gather, and she takes it out of the flame, lets it cool, get that glow go for a second, and then twists. And she is twisting. Um, both sides. She's making sure she may twist uh, more on one side than the other. So try to get a nice even twist. Um, how how quickly you twist and how much you twist is not only going to, um, it's also going to impact um, what the, the, the twist and what the stripe looks like. And now she's using a little bit of water to shock the, the, um, the twister off of the rod. Um, now that's I don't know if, still hot, so I'll put it over there. And here's here's one that I've made recently. Um, uh, here's the middle. The middle looks fabulous. I will <laughs> show you the ends. This is one end. And you can see how it's not as tight. It's a little looser. The 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 the, the twister itself is thicker. And then we get to this side, the other end, and there we go. So, but I can use the middle, so. <laughs> um, and, I'm going to take off the necklace I have, which is was 
a string of uh, what was found in a bed in Ireland, um, which is now stuck. But on there is the herringbone bead that is, um, was found in Ireland. And it's now stuck in my hair. Here we go. And it is made with two twisters. One was twisted going in one direction, the other in the other direction, and laid onto a blue base. And there it is. Oops. Sorry, you know, I use Zoom five days a week for work and I still can't find the camera. I have a, on my screen too, a picture of a similar bead just in different colors. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. So with making the twisties, there are actually a bunch of ways to do that. The way I first did that was kind of the, the easiest and fastest way, but if you noticed the, the middle of the glass was all kind of like wonky um, and I was able to pull that off and actually come out with something fairly decent because I've had a lot of practice. Um, I can show a couple other ways to make twisters that uh, help uh, secure the ends so that um, things don't flop around as much. There's probably like at least three or four different ways that I could think of, so I'll try to demo uh, one or two of the other ways. You also want your glasses to be of approximate equal size. The blue is a little bit bigger, but it should deal. And this one's going to start the same way, but I'm going to try to do something to the ends to make them a bit more stable. That bend, making that right angle on one side. And then you can see she's got the other side in the flame. And she's gonna do the same thing on the other side. And, um, Amongst the, the resources um, in the handout, YouTube, there are so many wonderful YouTube videos. Um, and you can kind of see if there's a particular instructor who you know, seems to a, a appeal to your learning style more than another. Okay. And there she goes. You can see how really how long that that pulled. And Lisa just dipped the end of her tweezers in her cup of water and was able to use that little bit of water to shock the end of the, the stringer from the rod on each side. So what I can do now is I can take this and I can apply it to uh, one of the other colored glasses. If I do it to the yellow, 
the yellow will blend in and you'll just see the red. Um, same thing if I do it on the red. So I'm gonna use something that's going to contrast with both. And Lisa, I don't know if at some point if you wanna um, use a transparent rod just so folks can see the difference. I can totally do that. Thank you. In fact, I'll use a little bit of one of the ones you let me, or not let me, gave me, because I can't exactly give it back. Just in beautiful beads. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, this is the cobalt blue. It's a very period color, and it'll make a nice contrast. Mm -hmm. But you can, as you watch the glass get warm um, and then get uh, the molten gather at the end, you can see if you notice any differences in how, what it looks compared to um, the opaque rod that, that she's, that Liz has been using so far. Uh, um, question, do we have to cool the stringers in the vermiculite? No, you do not. You just want them to cool down a little bit before you touch them with your bare hands. They, they do cool quickly, but they still start hot. <laughs> Especially if they're a little thicker. Yes, like those twisted stringers will take a little longer to cool. You see she's laying down um, another, another um, wind of a bead of glass next to her. And you can kind of see how, how with some of the, the opaque colors, um, some of them turned, turned uh, rods turn different colors. This just kind of, um, I don't know how you describe it, Lisa. Just kind of gets yellow and hot. <laughs> and hot and just, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, white will go a little clear mm -hmm. when it's heated. Um, because all of the glasses are made with different uh, metals and additives, they behave slightly differently. And I will also note that, um, yeah, different colors, some colors are more likely to, um, to um, uh, burn more easily in the flame if it's too hot. Um, some can get, um, can uh, get much more molten very, very easily. Um, and even different um, makers, different, um, you can have the same color glass rod, but made by a different company may react very differently. Um, there are, um, we did recommend um, some different companies to get glass, glass rods at. Um, we do mention in there that um, there's a company called Devardi that makes very inexpensive glass rods um, compared to others. However, they shock a lot, much more easily or much harder to work with. Um, and um, some of the, if you buy a kit may come with some of those. Um, we are using, um, uh, either, um, I think the, the, that cobalt blue is a, um, a Fetri, uh, Moretti or uh, otherwise known as just, um, a Fetri glass. Uh, creation is messy or CIM is another one. And there she goes. She is laying down her twisted stringer and you can see how, when she touches down, it melts and she lets it melt as she's turning the rod, uh, turning the mandrel to move the stringer. She also has to be careful what direction she's holding the stringer and lets it move because that stringer, that twisted stringer can unwind. So she's making sure that she's turning it and holding it and, and um, in the direction that um, it's twisted. Yeah, as I'm laying down, I need to, sort of keep twisting on it to, to twist it in the direction so it doesn't unravel. 
it probably unraveled a little here, so you'll be able to see that in a minute. Did you just shake and blow on that? <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna keep any of these, so I'm not worried yeah. about them surviving. So if you can we get a, want, they're all for demonstration. A, a better look at that. There you go. I think you can see the colors. Yeah, and of course, once it cools down, you really see what what the colors end up as. Um. Oh, yes. Um, question, can we post today's beads somewhere after they cool? Um, actually, probably at the very end, what I can do is show everything that I've made. Um, I'll also show you how to take things off the mandrel and stuff like that. We have yeah. until what time? 3.30. Okay. So we, have, we have some more time. And um, so, Lissa, um, we also, excuse me, both have, um, excuse me, blogs. Um, one one of ours is a much more updated than the other one, Lisa. Yeah. But um, on there, <laughs> you can see um, tomorrow there's going to be a great class on Viking beads of Reba and uh, Reba and uh, Berka. Um, um, but um, I know I believe Lisa on your blog. I know you have um, uh, the Anglo-Saxon project bead project that you've done. Um, I don't know if you still have the Merovingian and Frankish beads. Uh, yeah, there, well, I actually have two blogs. Um, one is okay. a blog spot. Probably that's the one you know. The other one is linked to my EK wiki. Oh, okay. And that's the one that has the EK wiki uh, linked blog yeah. is the one that has the different projects. Uh, yeah, there should be some good projects and documentation there. Um, there's also um, a, a great uh, a class that we've uh, done on the Anglo-Saxon and beads and the Irish beads that I've um, been studying. So for the last thing that I do, maybe the last thing or two, what I can do is I can um, apply the small um, Marini chips and then see if I can make one of these for you. That may take a little bit too much time, but I can at least show you how to apply it. Um, if anybody else wants to see anything differently, feel free to put it in the chat, otherwise, That'll probably be what I'll do. And those um, Marini chips, you can buy them pre-made with all different designs and 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 um, and uh, styles to them. Um, but um, so if that's something you want to try, but aren't don't feel you're quite ready to try to make one, um, that's another option as well. When you buy them, they'll probably be more more modern ones with flowers mm -hmm. and things like that but that's yeah. fine too they're fun um mm -hmm. my beginning kit came with a bunch of those even too oh wow okay. mine did not <laughs> i also while this is getting ready i'm going to just show you my fiber blanket i don't actually use this anymore but i do still have it um it's Two pieces. I have it in a roasting pan and um, for, for safekeeping and that's the fire. That did come with my my first kit. Um, but the neat thing is you, you know if you look at uh, my table or Lissa's table it's the coffee can. It's a ceramic mug to hold the water. Um, I have um, you know, another little ceramic jar to hold bits that um, break off that I want to use for other things. And Lissa, is your EK wiki under uh, Lissa Underhill? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Matt. It's a Y.
I don't know if, if anyone is not um, familiar with the EK wiki or, or how to find it. Um, let let me know on on chat. I am currently um, looking for the link. Make it easy to post for you. It it almost looks the the cobalt blue when it when it's really hot like that underneath the yellow. It almost has like a I don't know if that's like a pinkish uh, purple hue. So EK Wiki is. Um, uh, I will type it, the address, but it is a um, it is a um, site uh, where you can look up um, people uh, can post pages. Uh, Populous of the East Kingdom can post um, personal pages. Um, you can also find information about different um, groups, um, barony shires, um, households, guilds. And I am going to post that right now. Um, and if you um, don't have one and want one, it, they're actually not uh, terribly hard to, to set up. And um, let's see. So Lissa has picked up, she now has the, the tweezers with the bend in them. And I don't know, can think of the official name for that. And she's picked up the little piece of Marini. She heated up the bead in that one spot, heated up the end of the Marini because they both need to be hot enough to stick together. So what I want to do is really slowly preheat the Marini chip. If I get it too hot, um, it can crack. So I'm just kind of putting it near the flame and then moving it a little closer and then moving a little closer. All while keeping my other feed warm. And if you press them in, they will not expand as much. If I were to just let it melt in, it would kind of expand all over the bead. Which is fine too, if that's what you want. And then let's see if I can get it to show here. You can see a little bit, there you go. And I'll show you at the end. So the last thing I can try to do is make one of those canes. Uh, we only have about 15 minutes, so I'm gonna try to do it really fast and it might be a little, little chaotic, but I think I can make it work. Just give me one second. What colors are you doing, Lisa? I think I'll just do a uh, yellow and red uh, starburst. I just need to get out a new, new red. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Um. And just like with the twisties, there are a bunch of ways to do this. Um, I'm only going to be able to show one way, but it should give you the idea. What I want to do to start is make basically like a, a big little barrel, big little, um, like a barrel at the end of a glass rod. So I just hold it back and forth on itself until it gets uh, thicker. And then I will use my marver to just try to shape that however best I can. You can also use these uh, whoops, mashers to flatten beads. In this case, it's helping me make it into a little barrel shape. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to put a stripe down along that barrel. For right now, I'm just going to do a few red ones. You could do uh, different colors. You could go uh, like red, black, red, black, red, white, red, white, that sort of thing. If I wanted to keep it red and yellow, I might just put another yellow stripe down in between the red to create this. starburst pattern. Now probably the best way to do this is, see how I'm swiping down? I'm basically getting the glass hot, sticking it to the top, and just swiping down. This, 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 in this way, it's really like painting. Here I made it too thick, so I'm just trying to take a little bit of it. Now I'm going to add yellow in between the stripes of red. Now at this point, I can do a couple things. Um, what I could decide to do is just use another rod of glass to punty or stick it onto the other end and pull. Um, that can also be hard because do you see how this is sort of floppy with the, with the yellow glass? So what I can do is I can actually transfer this entire thing um, onto something else, either another glass rod, one that is um, stiffer, such as clear glass, or I'm just going to transfer this onto the metal chopstick. And then I'm going to take it off of the yellow one, and then get a second chopstick. And now I have this uh, little striped piece of glass with a pour in between these two metal chopsticks. And what I need to do is heat it, get everything to melt into a little ball, and then I can pull it. Just like we did with the twisted fingers, except you're not twisting. And we want it to be a little thicker than that twisted fingers to you. There we 
There we go. And I was blowing on it a little bit to get it to solidify. But you can see that's our little cane. I'm going to take it off. And in a couple seconds, we'll be able to, actually, maybe a couple minutes, we'll be able to see it a little better. And I can show you how to cut them. So what we can do is take some of the ones that we made before off. And let's do that one. Let's do the fruit one. Okay. So what I do to start with is I just soak them in some water. That's going to help uh, the bead release come off. Let's see. There we go. And just like that, um, sometimes I need to get, like I use my shirt to try to get a better grip on the glass bead because it's smooth and hold it. But that's basically how you can pull things off the mantle. I won't pull all of these off, but I'll bring them closer to the camera so you can see what some of them look like. So this was the speckled one. So this is one of our simple red round ones. This was our big dots. I'll find the, the good side of this bead because not all of it is, but you can see the multiple dots on one bead. Here is the melon bead with the little indents and the stringer on it. It's still not cooled down quite enough, but I'll show it to you anyway. <laughs> You can see the colors a little bit better. The yellow will brighten up and the red will brighten up a little more. You can see with the little millefiore, that one had uh, white and blue stripes. So since it was placed on a blue bead, the, the blue kind of disappears into the base bead. And that's just another example. Um, you can see a little bit here where I was playing around raking the bead. That's a mess because I did a lot of different things to it, but. And then let me find where I put that little cane. It's probably okay to touch. Yeah. So what I just wanna do is get my little uh, wheeled glass nippers. If I can figure out where I put them, that's actually a really good question. So I might not be able to find them for you, um, but what I can do is just thermal shock this and see if I can break it for you that way. There we go. Not the best break, but 
I just wanted to try to show you. It's, it's a little uneven break, but do you see the, uh, see the stripes? It's a little hard to see, but you can see that's what it looks like. And then you would have that same design and profile. And it's just like um, one of the other ones that, that I made as well. Um, oh, where is it? The, the blue one. So it's the same, pretty much the same design as that. The core will get smaller and as you smush it, the, the rays will spread out. Any other questions? Any other comments? In, in, in the group chat, I posted the EK wiki um, address, wiki.eastkingdom.org. And you can look under Elizabeth um, with, a, with a Y, not an I, Underhill. And I also uh, posted the direct link to your ANS blog. That from the wiki which is also you can access from the wiki page. Awesome. And anybody either watching this now or in the future, feel free to reach out to us. My email is on my wiki page. Um, we can both help you answer questions, uh, help you with resources, etc. We're more than happy to do that. Um, so real quick, a question. How do you cut um, the cane into pieces to put on a big bead? Um, there is um, a tool that is actually a, um, a glass cutter. Uh, Lisa, do you have the one that's the two, two round blades? Yeah, and then I just can't find it right now. Uh, each bl circular blade goes around the bead and then mine's not in the house as well. It then you can cut off pieces of, of, of the um, of the uh, the rod, either a cane or even a glass rod. Um, if you look at just glass nippers or tile nippers, um, you'll find two different yeah. kinds there. Or email me, and I'll send you a link. Any other questions? Okay, I am going to then stop the recording. Thank you all. <laughs>